You're listening to the All American Actors Podcast, Episode 35. In today's episode, get ready to learn what it takes to be an animation voice actor with the incredibly talented Bob Bergen. That's coming up next. Ready to go behind the scenes and learn what it really takes to build a sustainable career as a working actor in the U.S. film and TV industry? Join me, Catherine Beck, your All-American Accent Coach, as I give you the insight and inspiration to take action on your career. Learn my best tips and tricks to performing with an American accent and hear from working actors and other industry professionals to give you a comprehensive overview of this biz we call showbiz. This is the All-American Actors Podcast. Real quick, before we start today's episode, and oh, I am so thrilled to be speaking to today's guest because he has really shaped my perspective and career in the world of voiceover. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Kyle Wallbank, who says, I've spent some time learning tips and doing classes. I have found Catherine's tips great. A helpful reminder to what helps you achieve a good general accent. Thank you, Catherine. Aw, thanks, Kyle. So thrilled that my tips are helping you. And if you've been listening to this podcast and loving what you hear, do me a favor, click the subscribe button. If you haven't yet subscribed, tap those five stars and leave us a review to let me know what you think of this podcast. Apple's algorithm loves those reviews when it's ranking. So if you want to help us get noticed by other actors all across the world, go ahead and leave us a review. All right, today's guest is Bob Bergen, who is a master voice actor. You know how sometimes in your life you have a teacher that is so memorable because they challenge and inspire you and shape how you think about the craft that you love? Well, Bob was that teacher for me, and he really changed the trajectory of my career because I learned how to use my voice in ways I never thought possible. I learned how to bring animation characters to life with my voice, and I think that is the moment that I truly fell in love with voice acting. Bob Bergen has been in countless animated TV shows and movies. Most notable He is known for taking over the roles such as Looney Tunes characters Porky the Pig, Tweety Bird, and Marvin the Martian. But aside from his mastery of creating animated characters with his voice, he has worked in all areas of voiceover, from commercials to promos to radio imaging and trailers. Let's not waste any more time. I am beyond excited to share this interview with you, so here it is. Welcome, Bob Bergen, to the show. It's so great to have you here. It is great to be here, and and technology is amazing. You sound like you're around the corner. I know. That's the amazing thing about technology. And why don't we start by just telling the listeners a little bit about you? I am a voice actor. been working in this business almost 40 years. Uh, I do everything from animation to games to promo to narration. The only genre of voiceover I don't do is audiobooks, but uh, pretty much everything else. Amazing. And I took your class, gosh, I don't even remember exactly when it was. I think it it was, um, let's see, I left in 2005. So it was probably around 2003 or so, I'm guessing. Uh I took your animation class. And I have to say, Bob, you are one of those teachers that really change things for me, you know, really opened my mind. (laughs) It's true. Um, Really challenged me in a new way. And I loved going to class every day. And I loved the fact that at the beginning of it, I felt like I wasn't any good at it, but I would just go to class every week and I would try really hard. And even though I didn't feel like I was good, I felt like it was something that I could keep working on and improving. And the great thing about you as a teacher is that you're so inspiring every time. Oh, thank you. And so what do you love about teaching animation? Because you're so brilliant in animation, but as a teacher as well, what inspires you or motivates you to teach others the art of animation voiceover? You know, people who come and take my class will be the people who always do funny voices and they're like, oh, I do funny voices, I should do cartoons. And what I love about teaching is uh, watching their their eyes when they realize, oh, it's not about the voice, it's about the acting. Uh, what I always tell my students is all characters have a voice, but not all voices have characters. So it's about building characters. Uh, it's really, I, I start everybody as if they've never done this a day in their life. I don't care if they have. I, I want everyone to be on a, a level playing field. 
So there's no competition in the group. I mean, actually, I'm not even doing group classes anymore because of COVID. So I'm doing one on one. But it's it's still about creating characters and realizing it doesn't really matter what the character sounds like. The script is a skeleton. Your job is to give it a body. And that takes choices and that takes uh, intent and that takes um, uh, creating a character uh, with nothing but your voice. And it's a real fun process to watch uh, from take one where the actor just, you know, tries whatever's on their mind, usually just guessing to giving them some technique to follow and then watching them apply it. Uh, it's very gratifying because everybody grows no matter where you are in your career you're going to grow at the mic um, just by virtue of uh, applying stuff you've never done before or, or never knew how to do before. Yeah, so true. And I'm trying to think of things that you said or taught us that really uh, have sat with me over time and I've brought into any sort of animation voiceover work I've done. And one of the things I remember is you talking about that thing about that character that really makes them unique and yeah I, I call it a signature it's just something that makes it memorable it gives it the essence of its personality and you know if you look at uh major celebrities especially the old days of hollywood uh everybody had a signature it was always a jimmy stewart movie whether he was doing uh it's a wonderful life or a western same with john wayne same with bogart same with cagney and characters have to have something distinct about them. Oftentimes, it's just the actor playing them. This is why they hire celebrities to do animated features. You know, they, they, took, they take the animated character and they marry it to the celebrity's personality. Celebrities don't go to the mic and go, what voice should I do? They go to the mic and just like it was an on-camera job, they create a character. It happens to sound like them. So if you if you listen to uh, Finding Nemo, that's Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres didn't go up to the mic and go, what voice should I do? She played a character, and that character had a personality, and that character had cadence. It just happened to sound like uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, same with any character. Even if you're a non-celebrity, you've got to create something with a personality, something interesting. It's not just reading funny lines and funny voices. And if you think of a signature, which could be an accent, it could be a dialect, it could be a speech pattern, it could be intonation, it could be um, uh, uh, anything. Uh, it could be a, a, just a large adenoidal cold sound, but it has to be organic and it has to work for the character. You can't just do a quirk for the sake of it being a quirk. You have to do it uh, organically so it actually works within the character and the story. Is that something, so when you're auditioning for a new role or you get approached for a role, is that something that you create ahead of time or is sometimes that signature something that you find when you're in session? Oh, you know, uh, it's going to happen in the audition. Um, you know, the audition gets you the job. In fact, you're going to work harder in your audition than you will at the job. In the audition, you're going to add your own layers of creativity. Uh, if you don't take risks with your choices, if you don't make choices, uh, you're not going to get a call back. But bold, risky choices will get you a call back. At that call back, they might peel back some of those uber creative layers that got you in the room, but it may not work for the character. It may not work for what the network is looking for, but it got you in the room. And then your job is to adjust uh, and take direction uh, as, as given by the producers, directors, casting directors, et cetera. And then you get the job and you know, episode 10, your character's more evolved than episode one because you've done nine scripts in between and you feed the writers and vice versa. So as you start to learn the character, as you start to really uh, delve into, you know, writing changes and adapts and, and they, take, they, 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 they take your character in different directions. And then you do season three, which is different from season one. That's all cartoons. That's just growing as a character and, and an actor. When you record a cartoon for television, it, you might be done with the entire first season recording before it ever hits the air. And then you watch it and you go, because you don't watch it when you do it, you just do the scripts. And then you watch it and you're like, oh my gosh, I had to play this totally different if I'd seen that was the character's posture, that was their cadence when they walk. Um, but you can't change it now because you've already established the character. So um, it's, I don't watch a lot of my work 
And that's one of the reasons I it just, well, first of all, I'm too picky, but I also don't want to be influenced by anything I did in the past because I don't want to change what I'm doing today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Very true. I know I've been, I was working on an animated series once and it was a tricky character because she was a bit feisty. She was a little bit off-putting and so you have to find the likability in her. And it took us, I think, a few episodes of recording to find that voice. And then they actually had us go back and re-record her lines in the first two episodes because the energy of the character totally shifted to where it should yeah. be. Yeah. Has that ever happened as well for you? Uh, it's never really happened where I um, uh, changed the character so much with it, you know, into the series, we went back and redid it. But there have been times where I've found some things about the character and we'll just go in and change some ADR uh, on earlier episodes, but I've never, I've never had an experience where I've changed it that drastically. I know that um, there have been features where they've hired one celebrity to do the film, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, uh, Chris Farley was Shrek originally, and he did it with a Scottish accent. And um, actually, I don't even know if he did it with a Scottish accent, but he was doing, he did Shrek, and he died during production, so. Mike Myers came in. He was the one that did the Scottish accent. And I think it was halfway through the film where he goes, I don't, I don't think that's working. I want to change it. And, um, you know, that, that happens, but it doesn't happen to me that often, if ever. Oh, wow. I actually never heard that story before. That's incredible. So, what, Bob, you have played some really incredible characters. What is there any particular character that would be your favorite? Out of all well, the I got, yeah, I, I got into the business because I always wanted to be Porky Pig. So definitely my favorite. I mean, that is such a great story. Do you mind sharing it with the listeners? Oh, I've told it a million, a million times, but I'll give you the short version. Uh, wanted to be Porky Pig since I was like five. Um, we moved to L.A. My dad took a job in L.A. when I was 14. I called Mel Blank, found him in the phone book. Um, you know, uh I, during the course of the conversation, he mentioned the name of the studio he was working at that week. So when I finished my conversation with him, I called the studio pretending to be his assistant and got the day and time information. Uh, my mom took me to watch him record. And uh, I, I was only 14. And, you know, I was like, oh, we're, we're, dry, we're leaving the studio. I said to my mom, oh, wow, I can't be Porky Pig. He's still doing it. And my mom goes, yeah, and your voice hasn't changed. There's a lot of things we have to park on. So I called Hanna-Barbera and they referred me to Dawes Butler and I just started studying voiceover and acting and improv and um, got my first agent and my first job a week out of high school. And then I just spent five years with various survival jobs uh, as I was pursuing voiceover. It, you know, it, it didn't happen right away, but it took me about five years before I was able to make a living at it. You know, what's really interesting about this story is I know you posted something recently about this coming full circle that somebody had called you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That, was, that was just last weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So she was a, a young girl and she somehow got your number. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, I was at some friends. Uh, it was my first outing with some friends during COVID and, uh, my cell phone kept ringing. And it, was, it just said Beverly Hills with the number. And I'm like, oh, probably a telemarketer. And then it called back and then it called back. And I said, okay, excuse me, I'm going to pick this up. I said, hello. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Is this Bob Bergen? I said, who's this? And she goes, hi, it's, it's Sienna. Is this really Bob Bergen? I'm like, yeah, what can I do for you? And she was just wanted to get in the voiceover. So I said, like, how'd you get my number? Her sister got the number. I don't know how her sister got the number, but good for her. <laughs> so I excused myself and went in the other room and just had a nice little conversation with her about voiceover. She just picked my brain, asked me just tons and tons of really intelligent questions. So um, it was fun. It was, it was like I've completely gone full circle. That's pretty incredible to be the one now giving the, you know, the inspiration to the next generation of animation voiceover artists. and. You really are inspiring in so many ways. Like I said, you're one of those teachers that really stood out for me. And I think 
shifted the way I thought about voiceover. And you're so right that a lot of people go into it thinking, oh, I've got to have these funny voices, but it really comes down to the acting and devoting, you know, truthfulness to the character. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I remember going into classes and and looking at other actors and going, wow, the characters that they can create with their voice, how do they do that? I remember it took me a while to feel like I could, you know, create and craft a voice. It's at some point it seemed to me like this is like playing a musical instrument. Like I can bend and shape how I form the sounds to find that character's voice and what feels right to them. How do you explain that to your students? So now you're doing one-on-ones, like how you, you know, you use your lips or your, your, your lower jaw, your, you know, where you place the resonance to discover the character's voice. Cause I know that was a real struggle for me. Yeah. Well, the first thing we do is we look at the audition sides and you'll get a picture, you'll get a a brief description and you'll either get a few pages from the actual script, which is gold because you've got your scene partners there to react to, or more often than not, you just get about five to seven wild lines from various scenes in the pilot. And they're unrelated to each other. Uh, They might have an adjective like frustrated or anxious or giddy or curious. Your job as an actor is to fill in the blanks. Well, what is this character curious about? And the description is brief. Um, You need to make the choices that are going to make your audition pop and make your character pop. So you look at the physical, and if you see the character has an an underbite, just give yourself an underbite, you're going to change your voice without changing your voice just because of just moving your jaw. But that's just a part of of what the character is. And if you start with the sound, you're going to blow it. All characters have a voice, but not all voices have characters. I said that earlier. Um, If you're reading a scene and you've got a scene partner, and there's no information on the page who your scene partner is, even if it just says friend. Again, you have to fill in the blanks. How is this person your friend? How long have you known this person? Are you acquaintances or best buddies? Um, Are your wives friends? Did your kids uh, play together? Did you grow up together? Now, these are the the backstories, the layers of character that everybody does for, for film and for theater. And the audience doesn't know these choices, but what they know is a rich performance, a rich acting performance, uh, a rich character. It just adds to the truth of your of your acting. So putting it all together, voice acting and that signature we were talking about earlier, along with who am I talking to, what is our relationship, and where are we? It won't, this information may not be in the scene. You may not, it may not say they're in a library, they're outdoors, they're walking in movement, they're driving in a car, in a convertible, in traffic. So all of these choices are going to add to your performance, whether it's volume or intensity or emotionally. So it's just about making acting choices. Again, the same process you would do if you were on stage or for a camera. You've got to make choices. The only wrong choice an actor can make is not make one, but you can't make a wrong choice. You got to commit to it and you can't audition to please the listener. You've got to audition just to have fun and to create an authentic character. If you're worried about, am I right? Am I doing it right? Are they going to like this? You're going to be in your head and there's going to be a a layer of uh, non-commitment that you can hear. uh, And it's just, it's, it's, it's not appealing. You, you you just want to have fun with your characters. And if you if you get the job that's icing on the cake, if your audition is just, if your goal is just to have fun, then your odds of booking are better. If your goals are to get the job, there's going to be that sense of desperation that reads into a mic like crazy and you don't want to be desperate. It's so true. Everything reads into the mic, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You can hear it. You can hear that 
every last bit of worry or fear or insecurity or doubt comes through. Yeah. And maybe that's just what it is. It's just getting that mic time. You know, actors could be so used to working on stage or on screen, but as soon as you get in front of a microphone, it's like a whole new thing <laughs> until you get used to it. And you can feel like you can, you know, do what you do best instead of worrying so much about what the other person's going to think about how it sounds on the other end. Right. Exactly. And, you know, it just takes practice. It takes uh, experience. Um, today in voiceover, there is nobody in the room with you. You're by yourself auditioning. There's nobody there to tell you you can't make that choice. So just get that out of your head and make the choices that you think are fun. How does it feel now, you know, with the way things have shifted during COVID of having, you know, pretty much doing everything via your home studio as opposed to like, are you working on shows at home? Is there anything that's happening in studio yet for you? Uh, not for me. There, there, some people are, but I won't. Uh, I'm very, you know, I, I had my, I never worked from home. I, I only auditioned from home and about 10 days into COVID, I had a broadcast quality home studio and have been just the, the year of COVID has been crazy busy. I have absolutely no desire to go into a studio right now. I still, I know that things are, the numbers are changing and uh, hopefully continue to go in the right direction. But if I don't have to be in a room and risk something, I don't want to. So this is going great. Oh, well, that's really cool to hear. You know, I'd be curious to know, you've had such an amazing career along the way. Has there been any other voice actors that you've worked with or um, directors that have given you little kernels of goodness that have really inspired you and shaped the way you approach animation voiceover? Well, I will tell you that everything I do in my classes, uh, I'm a complete fraud. I plagiarize everybody. I can't take credit for 99% of what I do because all I do is take from the Dawes Butlers and the John Ruskin who was my acting coach and um, uh, great directors like Colette Sunderman and Jack Fletcher and just spew out what they say to me. You know, uh, one of the things I say to my students now that I got from Colette Sunderman uh, when we were teaching together uh, I was just watching her work with the students and this, this student was having a difficult time creating uh, um, the scene. She, the character was fine, but there was something lacking. She wasn't able to color the picture vocally. And so Colette said to her, see it in your head and then vocalize it. See the situation, see the land, see the colors, see how they're drawn. And you have to make this up because you can't see it. It's not there. See it in your head. And then, voc and then vocally perform it. And I say that all the time to my students now. See it in your head, then react. Um, and acting is reacting. I'm a Meisner-trained actor, which is basically working off your scene partner. Where's your scene partner when you're working solo? In your imagination. Where is your scene partner when you're doing a monologue on stage? In your imagination. So it's not different. It's just technically different because there, there's a microphone. But 80% of animation is in the imagination. And by the way, that one was mine. I did make that one up. <laughs> I love it. And I do remember, you know, you talking about that. And another thing that really stuck with me in class was bringing the body into it as well. You know, if you fit, you can physicalize the character as you're in front of the microphone, that that really helps make it come to life as well. And I know that that's always been a really big thing for me as soon as I get in front of the microphone and I'm performing as, as this character, once I get that physicality, I'm right in it. And, and that was from you too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, for television animation, you're hired for, for minimum scale uh, to at least do two characters. You might have a two-way conversation with yourself. You might have a three or four-way conversation with three or four completely different characters. If each character has a different posture, a different facial expression, different body language, different gestures, then you're going to be able to go from character to character throughout the script without blending and, and without breaking character. You can't anticipate you've got the next line because you have to stay in the moment. You finish what you're doing with this character and then you go to the next character and their intents might be completely different. One might be sound asleep and the other one might be running into their room because their house is on fire. So you have to play them in the moment 
uh, according to what they're doing in the story. That's not easy. And that's the thing that people need to understand. That's why I always say study acting first, because without acting um, technique behind you, the difference between a trained actor and a non-trained actor is uh, a trained actor makes a choice, a non-trained actor makes a guess. You need the proper skills to repeat your, your talents at will consistently. So this uh, this thing about, oh, I just want to do funny voices. It's not, it's not about the funny voices. It's, a, it's about what you do with those words on that page. Totally. That is probably one of the hardest things to do is when you've got a scene and you're playing both characters at the same time, talking to each other and um, being able to get to that point where you can really be specific about who that character is versus the other one and be able to jump back and forth. Took me some time. And uh, yeah, Yeah. it is one of it's, it's a skill, isn't it? To be able to, to do that, that next level of animation. It is. And you know, every job is different. Some directors will say, you know, let's do one character all the way through and then let's do the other character all the way through. And then they'll give you a a reader or the director will feed you the, uh, the other character's lines and then some directors, you know, I just did something for, uh, I think it was Nickelodeon, where I was playing five or six different characters in the same show, and they wanted me to go all the way through it. You know, uh, if it didn't work, we would go back and redo it individually. But, uh, you know, I really, for I don't have a preference. I, I, I don't mind trying whatever the director wants to try. Definitely. And I think that's where you mentioned improv in your training. I think that's where that comes in as well, where you get real comfortable working with whatever the requests are of the director on the spot too, right? Yeah, I'm a huge, huge advocate of studying improv. Um, you know, I I do honor the writer. I do respect the writer. But, you know, you're, an actor is brought in to bring something to the table. And what improv teaches you is to make solid choices. You know, the only rule of improv is you can't deny. So with those improv skills, you're going to take it another step. It doesn't mean you improve on the writer. It means you accentuate the character and the writer. And it really just, you know, especially for the audition, it just brings things to life. Definitely. So what are you working on now, Bob? Is there any new projects coming up? I'm working on a Star Wars show for Disney Plus called The Bad Batch. And that debuted on May 4th, which is kind of a Star Warsy thing. May the 4th be with you. Um, and I play a, kind of a villainous character named Lama Sue. Very different from Looney Tunes. He's, uh, <clears throat> he's very cold and calculated. He's just an evil guy. But you never really know what he's thinking or doing. He's kind of fun. Um, I'm doing, uh, let's see what else I'm doing a show for Netflix called Ridley Jones, which I think they've used in June. We're, we're actually recording season two, but season one, I think they've used in June. And with that one, I play the curator of the museum named Mr. Peabody, who does not like children whatsoever. Um, <laughs> we're doing, we're still working on finishing up Looney Tunes cartoons for HBO Max, where I'm, I'm able, able to eat that porky pig and all kinds of other characters. Um, Let's see. What else? What else? What else? What else? What else? I uh, started a new series. Oh, I can't talk about that. I just, you know what? That's the thing, uh, Catherine. There's so, as you know, there's so many things under NDAs we can't talk mm, about. And I almost yeah. just gave one away. I got two new Looney Tunes series that I'm about to work on that I'm going to keep my mouth shut about. Okay. Uh, amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, one, one I can talk about, I think it's called Bugs Bunny Builders and they have announced that. So I can talk about that one. And that's kind of like Looney Tunes for preschools for preschool kids um, and a whole bunch of other things that I just can't talk about right now. I just love that you've got such versatility in the characters that you play. It's so much fun to hear your work. And oh, thank you. Yeah. And it's, it's always such a great lesson as well. I, you're one of my favorites to listen to and, and, you know, see where your, your journey as a voice actor continues I miss you. It's been a million years since I've seen you and had a margarita with you. I know, right? Yeah, I miss those Vox on the Rocks days, all of it. As we wrap this up, this has been such a joy just to catch up. And is there any sort of words of wisdom that you have for young actors just starting out, thinking about voiceover in general? 
you know, what advice would you give to those newcomers to the industry? It is called voice acting for a reason. Um, study acting, become a great actor, and then study voiceover. Do not pursue or uh, think demo until you're ready, because one bad demo will close many more doors than a great one will open. Um, do not go into this business for the money. To go into this business because acting feeds your soul the way food feeds your body. If you go into this for the money, you're more likely to undercut and just do it for almost free, or you'll get to a point where you're never happy because it's never enough. Um, you've got to do it because I do, I do voiceover because I get high at the mic. I literally, that's my happy place. And I am, I'm just in a Zen zone at the microphone. Getting paid for it is a fortunate uh, circumstance. I didn't get into it in 1982 to get paid, and I'm not in it today to get paid. I'm in it because I get to do what I love. If there's anything else in this world that you love more than voiceover or acting, do it because there, there are no guarantees. There are no necessary uh, returns on your investment. It's a lot of heartbreak. But if you don't care, if you don't, if if the obstacles, if the challenges, uh, if the uh, odds of just doing day jobs and night jobs to pay the bills while you pursue professional acting don't bug you, then you're right for this business. If it sounds too daunting and too difficult, find something that you don't mind working your ass off to do because you just love the whole journey. Love it. And if any of our listeners want to keep up to date with projects that you're working on, how can they find you? Oh my goodness, I'm everywhere. I'm on, <laughs> uh, I, on Instagram, Bergen.Bob. On Twitter, at Bob Bergen. I'm on Facebook. I, 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 you can find my email. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. I think I'm actually in the phone book. That's probably how that girl called me. <laughs> That's but, probably. Um, yeah, but who looks in phone books anymore? She does. Right, exactly, right? <laughs> Bob, thank you so much for being on the show with us. Uh, like I said, you are by far one of my favorite, most memorable teachers. You're such an inspiration to me and I know to a lot of other actors around. So thank you so much. Oh, uh, my pleasure. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Bob, for your generosity of your time and sharing your wisdom with us. You are so inspiring to me, and I know my listeners too. So from the bottom of my heart, a ginormous thank you to you. And if you're inspired to learn more about the craft of voiceover, I've put together a free guide for you on some of the do's and don'ts when you first start learning the craft of voiceover. If you'd like to grab a copy of it, head over to katherinebeck.com voiceover, and that's one word, no spaces, voiceover. Catherine Beck dot com slash voiceover it's yours it's free so just head over there now and remember if you love this episode go ahead and let me know take a screenshot of the show share it on your instagram story and tag me in it at katherine underscore beck underscore you can find me there if you've got any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the podcast just let me know and coming up next week on the show i am continuing on this voiceover series with another great interview i'm going to be talking with voiceover actor becky boxer who's going to share with us the wonderful world of voicing video games. Now make sure to share the show with all your actor friends, let them know what's coming up next week, and invite them to tune in with you and learn how to become an all-American actor so you can be the working actor you dream to be. Until then, go practice your American accent, and I'll see you back here next time.